Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of a podcast that we currently don't have a name for. Um, my name is Jamie Whiffin. I'm here with George Blackman and Gwilym Sims Williams. And we've kind of got no constraints on this podcast. We don't really know what it's going to be about at this stage. It's most likely going to be about the creator economy, our freelancing careers, the online businesses that we're growing. And we kind of just want to talk about this every single couple of weeks, give some insights some lessons that we've learned from most likely the mistakes that we're making. Uh, and hopefully you can take something from that um, we work in the creator economy as script writers youtube producers consultants thumbnail designers and sort of everything in between and so hopefully there's going to be something in there that's sort of interest to you um, i think before we sort of get into the actual podcast it might be a good idea to introduce ourselves um, and kind of just give some background on who we are um, so george do you want to give us some context on, on who you are and then Gwilym and i can give some information on myself Sure. Um, hello, my name is George. I was uh, a script writer for Ali Abdal. That was kind of where I got my start in all of this. Um, and these days I'm sort of pivoting away from the education niche more into kind of entertainment content as a script writer. Um, and then as Jamie said, in that time I sort of picked up um, some consulting work as well uh, and generally uh, just really honing in on the kind of craft of script writing for creators and trying to uh, teach my audience on uh, Twitter and my newsletter how to how to write better scripts basically uh, that keep audiences watching for longer uh yeah and i'm i suppose i have a similar background to george in that i started off writing scripts for ali um and then from there I branched out doing freelance script writing for other creators um but i'm kind of uh i guess like a full stack uh creative uh writer assistant person in that i i also write newsletters i write for Twitter, so if people want threads written, um, yeah, I still write scripts for different creators and I do some channel management and consulting on the side. So it's like a big bundle of all the different stuff you can do in the creator economy behind the scenes as someone who's decent at writing. Yeah, it's, it's quite similar for me. I've, I think I've always sort of been a, a handyman, uh, you know, master of none. I've kind of just done a bit of everything um i kind of started making youtube videos when i was 12 so a very long time ago now back in like 2007 2008 um had a gaming channel grew that to about 100k subscribers um sort of went to university then went into youtube agency a tiktok agency uh and then worked full-time as ali abdul's youtube producer and then for the past year I've been doing this freelancing thing as a YouTube consultant, thumbnail designer for quite a few big YouTubers. Um, and very similar to, to Gwilym, I've kind of just done a, a bit of everything really. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm kind of excited for this podcast and kind of just being able to talk about this stuff because I, I find that I'm not like you guys. You guys are obviously writers. And so you can, you know, put out with these great tweets. For me, I feel like I'm much more of a talker. I prefer to just have conversations about these kind of things. Um, and so I thought one of the, the first things that we could talk about here, I guess, is for, for the people who are interested in the creator economy and want to have jobs like we do, um, how they can kind of get into this space and kind of like some advice that we could potentially give them on, you know, how to work for their, their favorite YouTubers or at least how to, to get a job in like marketing or, or the creator economy and like these TikTok and YouTube agencies I've worked in. Um, George, kind of give us your, your background on how you got here. Cause I, I know like 18 months ago, your life was like completely different to, to what it is right now. Yes. Um, I, and I, I, I said before the show to you guys that I kind of struggle with giving out advice when it comes to this stuff, mainly because the start that I had, and potentially the same for you, Gwilym, I'd be interested to hear more about that, but um, it, it was a little atypical and going from basically zero uh, in terms of having never worked for a YouTuber before, never worked in that industry, never really worked in social media, um, going from that to working for Ali Abdal, who had about 3 million-ish at the time that we joined, um, was unusual. Um, so in that case, it was literally just he'd put out job applications. I'd been fortunate enough that I discovered his channel about two weeks before that happened. And I just thought these videos are interesting to me. That sounds like a fun job. And I was working at the time in like a police control room, which was not the dream <laughs> at all. It was exactly as boring and terrible as you would expect. Um, so it was for me just a chance to move into something much more creative, which... Uh, it's something that I'd always wanted to do. And I had always been a creative person. I wrote a lot of comedy shows and things when I was at uni. Uh, and similar to you, Jamie, not quite to the same extent, but I did, you know, had YouTube channels when I was, uh, you know, going through school and, you know, just about got to the point where I was monetized. And I don't know, I, I enjoyed that world. 
Um, but in terms of, yeah, like tips to kind of get into it, uh, I think the way we did it is probably, probably not the most common way that you should look out for it. It was a much more steep kind of ramp from, you know, naught to 100, as I say, than you would expect uh, most of the time. Um, and maybe this will just be like the general discussion for the whole thing. But I guess I will seed my time with this first bit of saying the way we did it, probably not the way uh, to to try and get into it if that's what you're looking for. Although, keep an eye out. YouTubers do in their description boxes or on their Twitter, they will just sometimes say, I'm looking for X person. Uh, so just keep an eye out for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say we were specifically lucky, I guess, in, in working with Ali in that Ali literally his his he runs the part time YouTuber academy that teaches people how to scale up their YouTube channels and be YouTubers, and so a big part of working with him was like getting this crash course into the meta of building a YouTube channel. So it's it's almost the ideal place to start. Um, mm. Like obviously you could go and work with Mr Beast or something and learn how a massive channel works, but um, yeah, Ali was a was, is, is a good way to start. Um, I would say, yeah, the, for someone who wants to replicate that, it would be following your favorite creator, just kind of keeping tabs on what they say and do. And rather than what we did, which is like, see it, be quite passive, see a job application pop up and be like, oh, I guess I could do that. It's better to actually reach out directly and be like, have you thought about getting scripts written? Um, because... Uh, then you're just competing in a field of one person who is you, who's popped up and seems interesting. Um, and then that gives them something to think about. Um, because, yeah, uh, they could have just gone with another candidate. I don't think we were uniquely positioned to get those those starter jobs. I, I feel like for me, because I, I, I took a, a very different approach to sort of coming into the, the creator economy to, to you guys. Um, I would say that I, I done it in quite a... a a traditional way and i think like when i think about how someone nowadays can kind of get into this space i i feel like broadly there's there's three ways the traditional way is similar to myself where it's like you're interested in social media you use it every day you're kind of obsessed with it you like sort of like the the back end of it not just the creativity part and you kind of get a job working in a YouTube agency or a TikTok agency. I've born, raised in London. And so there's always these kind of businesses around. And for me, I just kind of went around the houses. Like as, as a kid, I made YouTube videos. So I learned how to talk to the camera. I learned how to be a video editor, how to make thumbnails, how YouTube worked. And that allowed me to go and work for free for a, a video production agency and learn a little bit more about all of those skills. I went to university and learned more about those skills. And so over time, I was just like kind of building my my knowledge and my skill set. And that really helped me to then get that job at the YouTube um, agency called Little Dot Studios outside uh, of, of university, my, my first job. And there I was working on what they call hub channels, which is that their, base, their business model is basically let me go to super nanny and gordon ramsay and like all of these shows and documentaries from like the early 2000s buy the licensing to those uh, episodes and then cut those clips up for youtube and so they had these hub channels i was manager of two of them and it also work um on gordon ramsay's main youtube channel where we'd cut, cut up kitchen nightmares clips make thumbnails titles and upload them and like in that process i learned so much more about the business side of youtube and not just the creative side which i'd spent the previous like six or seven years learning by actually being a creator myself and i feel like that's kind of like where most people should really try and start i think believing that you can just go straight into the creative economy can happen but it's more difficult if you don't have the, the knowledge the skills or a body of work to show that you can do what you're doing um and so for most people like there are so many youtube agencies in just london for example and obviously with re remote work now you can apply to these places and you you can work in so many different ways um from creating thumbnails, editing, to dealing with the sponsorships, which is something that I did all in the TikTok agency. And that taught me so much more about short form and, and negotiating sponsorship deals. And so I think taking that approach is probably like the safer option. You know, you're going to get a steady paycheck. You're not going to be, you know, just tweeting things and, and hoping that you get a client and outreaching to people, which you absolutely can do and get your leg in the door that way. But I think that 
going the traditional route and having a job and then leaving or trying to work for a creator instead of an agency and then leaving and doing your own thing is like just way better than kind of jumping off the cliff and hoping that you can fly. Um, so for me, like getting the traditional job, I would say is like what you should try and do. I feel like it's much easier to do that than to sustain yourself as a freelancer in, in the creative space. And if you do want to take that approach, I feel like the second way really is by having that por portfolio and willing to, to, to work for free or, or for low cost, you know, is what I did a lot of the time. Um, I would work for people just by saying, hey, I'll edit your videos or I'll make a thumbnail or whatever it was. And that just allowed me to work with more people again, build up my skills, have a website that had all of this portfolio on it that showed that I wasn't just a talker, that I could actually walk the walk as well. And that just meant that because I had 10 thumbnails or 10 videos under my belt, I could then get an 11th and then a 12th. And you just build up this portfolio and there's this body of proof and more people are willing to work with you, at least in my opinion. And then I also feel like the, the third method that you can kind of get into this space is do it for yourself. You don't have to work for another creator. You can be the creator yourself and show, hey, I know how to video edit because here's my videos or here's the thumbnails that I've made. And I feel like if you can grow a YouTube channel, it's much easier for you to transition into working for someone else or partnering with someone in some way. Um, and so, yeah, that's like a very long answer to that. But I, I feel like there's there's multiple ways of kind of like getting into this industry. And it doesn't always mean that you have to start off like working with a YouTuber, you know, very similar to like how you guys did it. I was really interested. I was really interested in yeah the way you were talking about the different ways to kind of build up that experience pre going all in on being whatever it is that you want to be for your favorite creators and and this is like a, i think that speaks to a more general point about the kinds of skills that you need to build up when you're trying to get into all of this stuff you don't need to go straight into the specific thing that you love and that you want to do and do only that and in fact i think it's probably would be bad advice to do that and and that's something that I've definitely found with some of the clients that I've worked for since um, working with Ali, but then even while working with Ali, in fact, Ali's probably the best example. Like while there, we all kind of had to, you know, muck in a little bit here, there and everywhere. We all chipped in a bit for the part-time YouTuber Academy, as you were saying, Gwilym. And um, that's where you started writing Ali's newsletter for a bit. And um, and I started writing another newsletter within the whole Ali yeah, ecosystem. And as a result of that, other clients that I've moved on to work for Similarly, I've then been able to say, oh, I can also write newsletters, which I guess would be similar to you, Gwilym. Um, But then I think having that kind of more flexible mindset has meant that, for example, one of my first clients when I went freelance was a guy called Justin Moore, Creator Wizard, um, who is kind of like the sponsorships guy, if uh, you haven't heard of him. Um, and a byproduct of joining him as his YouTube scriptwriter meant that I was then just constantly learning more and more about sponsorships, which is something that I hadn't previously had any real experience doing. And so writing his newsletter every week where I, it was forcing me to think about that stuff has just more and more equipped me to be able and feel willing to offer that to other creators when if I'm offering a creator that I really like and I want to work for them, I can sort of throw into the package as part of, oh, not only can I rewrite your hooks for you or write your scripts for you, but I'm also more established at uh, negotiating sponsors sponsorships. Um, and again, the byproducts of that for my own newsletter, it then means I, I felt way more equipped when the first person reached out about sponsoring me. I felt like I knew exactly what to do. And so I think broadening, uh, building up those soft skills across the board throughout all of this even if you know at the end of it, you want to be specifically like a channel manager or a thumbnail designer or, well, thumbnail designers may be a bit more specific, but um, the point is you don't need to go right into the thing you really want and do only that. I think you should try and build up lots of skills across the board. And um, yeah, I think, um, I think a reasonable path would be uh, start off by working with smaller creators where you can, where you're both experimenting and you can make a bunch of mistakes and learn what works well. Um, and besides, you probably won't get the big creators to work with you when you're starting off anyway. So that's realistically your only option. Mm. Uh, and then once you've done that, maybe scale up to working with people that you can learn from. So like Justin is a good example for you, George, like um, people where you're not only getting paid, but you're also getting paid in sort of this sort of experience learning through osmosis, looking at how they, they, they function like I don't know how, how they manage their internal team, um, all that stuff, how they communicate with you. Cause at some point you might be hiring people 
and so you can learn from what they do well and what they don't do so well yeah 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 i, I think that's that that's like a, a really important point of like starting small and and building up over time i think so many people would now have like this moonshot where they try and go for the big creators and it has happened for a lot of people it does work but it's like everything in life you know that there are exceptions to the rule i think for most people who want to get started especially if you're young and you're like a teenager and you're listening to this like you've got so much time you know as long as you work hard and you keep doing these things outside of school for example or if you're a bit old outside of work you you will naturally get there like i said i started making youtube videos when i was 12 i'm 27 now um and I've just gone and done a bit of everything, right? And it's kind of going back to, to what George was saying is that you don't have to say, hey, I just want to be a thumbnail designer and you go and do that. You might want to try a little bit of everything and kind of see, you know, what am I good at? What am I bad at? And what do I actually enjoy? You know, like for me, I was quite a good video editor, but I kind of just looked at it and went, oh, after a while, you know, it's been a few years, don't really enjoy it as much. It takes up a lot of time. I kind of like doing these other things. I can always like pay someone to do the video editing. Um, I could also go and like do something else. I feel like having, you know, your knowledge is probably like a little bit more tangible. You can sell that at a higher rate than you ever can like a video. Like there are all of these things that will naturally come to you the more that you explore the other options that you have. And so like George was saying, I, I think becoming a jack of all trades is, is like really underrated. I feel like people always want to be like the best at something, but it's like, just be like mediocre at everything to start with and just find your voice and what you like to do. You know, it's kind of like when you start a new YouTube channel, everyone's always like, oh, I want to be the next whoever. And they, they try and replicate someone else's style and then they burn out because they don't get the same results. Or they don't find it as fun. Where it's like, just start making videos with zero expectations. You know, just go into it having fun, like what I did with the gaming channel. At no point did I think I'm growing a business here. I'm going to make money. I was just uploading videos with my friends playing games. And over time, I worked at what my niche was and it became something, you know, like I say, got to about 100K subscribers. And when people, yeah, they, they start their YouTube channels now, it's like, you, ha you can either be an explorer where you just go around and you, you try out different types of content. You might say, I like cooking. I'm going to make a cooking video. I'm going to try a vlog. I'm going to try gaming. I'm going to try gardening, like whatever it is, what your interests are, see what you like making, see what resonates with others and just slowly learn. And once you kind of say, you know what, I am going to be a gaming channel, for example, that's when you can be an engineer. You know, that's when you can strategize and, and say, how am I going to make it as a gaming YouTuber? But if you start there from the beginning, you might have found, actually, I would be better suited as a cooking YouTube channel, right? But you will never know if you just decide, I want to be this one thing. And like I said, that, that applies to getting a job in the creator economy or being an actual creator. Hmm. Um, jumping off from y your point about d being decent at editing, but not wanting to commit to it, like, as the thing that you were doing, like Jamie, the editor, uh, George, I got a question for you, mainly because I'm just interested in it. Um, uh, what do you enjoy doing the most out of your various creator tasks? And yeah. what feels like, what does, is there anything you feel like you do too much of that you would prefer to move away from, etc.? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, and I actually wondered if this could almost be its own topic for this discussion, because I feel like, especially having a job that is above averagely kind of like fun in quotes or would appear that way from the outside i kind of just sum up when people ask oh do you do you enjoy it? i'm like oh yeah it's brilliant but then if when you kind of break it down there are definitely some things that i suppose do become quite repetitive and actually you think am i am i really enjoying this and that was kind of a thing i was going through recently where i realized i've been working on education content the the whole time that i've been in this industry and i was kind of I, I still enjoying it enough like ultimately i would still sit down at my desk and get to write youtube videos which is a crazy privilege and was was always fun and always creative but um yes yeah, i think certainly that as a as a topic i started becoming way more interested in moving into the education stuff so that's like a macro sorry into entertainment stuff which is more of a macro idea of where you wanted to go but i am definitely in this position where i feel like now i'm at this kind of point where i need to try and create leverage for myself by handing some things off to other people. I've managed to hand exactly one thing off 
uh, to somebody else, which is basically prepping my newsletter, which doesn't mean writing it. It means literally just uh, editing the retention graphs to make them look nice and putting them in my newsletter ready for me to start writing. But I I feel like there must be a lot more, a lot more stuff to try and get rid of. Um, the client work I really love, the personal brand, like business stuff, I also really love. But there's, there's I guess there's kind of two questions that the client stuff, I wouldn't, I'm not at the point where I want to think about an agency or hiring other writers or like any of that. Like I just, I want to do the writing because I like doing it and it's it's the thing that teaches me the most. So there, now I'm pivoting towards a style of content I like, I'm satisfied. But the personal stuff, when it comes to like, yeah, emails, prepping tweets, um, just replying to Twitter DMs, that's a big one. And I kind of ignore it for like weeks at a time because like you get so much... <laughs> crap in the inbox um that's the stuff that i want to try and figure out a way to kind of offload but i'm not really sure what yeah this this Mm. is such like a an interesting point because i i I am like the exact same i was like should i be outsourcing that if yes who do you go to like i think like whitey jobs that paddy galloway created has been like so good for like finding certain people to help with these tasks but i feel like there needs to be more categories more people need to know about it because it is hard to just find people to outsource things to um like when we had dinner a few weeks back and you mentioned oh yeah i'm I'm outsourcing like the the preparation of my newsletter i was like oh that's genius like there were weeks where i would just not upload uh, sorry make make a newsletter because I couldn't be bothered. It was like, I don't want to go and find the images and add them and write the headers and copy and paste the links. Like, I just want to write the newsletter very quickly. And I found someone who's very useful at that, who I've worked with when I was building the Thumbnail Vault and and like a few of the other projects. And she was so helpful with it. Very, very easy, simple. I was consistent for like three weeks. And because she herself is very talented, she wants to go and do more video editing stuff. And she's like, I don't really have the time anymore. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. now I'm back to, to, to the, you know, the, the beginning and I got to try and find someone. And so if you're listening to this and uh, <laughs> you, you want a little help, please DM me. I, I'm happy to, to help there. Uh, <laughs> always with the shameless plug. Um, but yeah, like it, it was so useful. And I just think, you know, there needs to be a way to find these people, you know, it, it'd be so, so helpful. And, being able to yeah identify what what are those areas that you need to outsource you know i feel like it's it's easy with things like video editing you know you know you can outsource that thumbnail designers there's so many on twitter you know you can outsource that um but even just like the little jobs it's like you need like your all-round kind of like creator economy helper who who can like help you work maybe that's a personal assistant i don't know that's what i'm saying like i'm new to this business stuff i don't know <laughs> i think i think the 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 problem is is that like really dependable trustworthy people who can make the same types of calls that you would um mm, that's important will often like move on because they are they can do other stuff that is like higher leverage than something that someone like us can't be bothered to do um uh and it's it's I might be shooting myself in the foot here if I do start a writing agency. So sorry, future me. But I feel until you're at the point where you have loads and loads of contacts and you could start, like if you're like Sahil Bloom and you can start a writing agency to write YouTube scripts, then sure, he's got massive distribution. But from our perspective, I I feel like I'd just be uh, like... I would be talking to the people who I had employed to be my like um, the the writers at my agency, and I would feel like if I was being honest with them, I would tell them go and do it yourself, do it freelance, <laughs> don't have me like skimming <laughs> the twenty percent off the top or whatever it is. Um, yeah, uh, because once they're good enough, they should probably leave. And I, I I guess I would always feel like there's this tension between like running this business where you know that the good ones should leave. Mm-hmm. But I imagine that's probably the case with so many traditional businesses. Like th- there must be so many people who are just very good. Even you know, like a plumber, for example, might work for a plumbing company, but that plumber can very easily be independent or, or build their own company. But they just don't know. And I don't imagine their boss would be like, "Oh, by the way, you're my top guy. See ya. You know, go do your own thing." You know, I, I, one of the things I really liked um, that Ali said last year. Um, 
I can't remember when he said this, but he said, I really like the idea that my business is like a university. He was like, I call it like the Ali Abdul University, where people come into the business. They're there for, you know, a year, two years. They help with the channel. They help in the business. They learn a bunch of stuff and then they leave and they go and do their own thing. And I, I really like that because I thought that's, that's such a nice way of, of, of doing things. And I think if you treat people well within a job, and then they go and create their own thing. And as we know, the creative economy is quite small. Everyone knows everyone. I just feel like that's such a good thing. Like, I feel like that give, gives you more people that you can go and speak to in the future, you know, and say, you know, you're, you're now, you know, you have your own writing agency after you worked for me for two years. You know, can, can we work together here? And I just feel like that the relationship will be so much better than if you just kind of like retained everyone and never let anyone kind of soar and do their own thing. Um, but that might be completely wrong. I don't know. But I, I really liked Ali's approach to that, to be honest. Yeah, I think I think a lot of um, people. I think a lot of money is made out of like ignorance and fear, basically. Like um, people reaching out with like sponsorship deals that they know are low balls. Um, people keeping employees that they know they could be paying a lot more, or who they know they could be paying a making a lot more somewhere else. Um, uh, yeah. I had another thing to add to that, but I've forgotten what it was. Well, maybe just tailing off of that, that's maybe like a broader kind of point or I guess question to ask what you guys think as we've all been on both sides of it, what your thoughts are on working full-time for a creator versus freelance. And do you think it is necessary or better to start with one, um, even if the other might be a better choice? I don't know. Maybe you think the one to you know, like you love full-time and that free full-time is also better I, i'd be interested to know your thoughts um uh i mean uh, i'm not sure is the answer i'm not sure i have enough experience of full-time work with different creators to make that call because it could be very different but um i know the one massive benefit of full-time is that you get an overview of the whole shebang you're not just the thumbnail designer who's in one slack channel who knows how to make great thumbnails but is maybe not clued in on everything else um so yeah the, i think the main advantage of full time is that you get to see everything that's happening and and maybe um you yeah you get to be involved in decision making that you wouldn't otherwise be involved in which is good learning for the future what do you reckon jamie i, I need clarification on, on, on the questioning because i'm not sure i fully understand so you, are, are you saying is it better to work in a traditional role and then go be- No, no, no. In terms of being in the creator economy, do you think it is more uh, enjoyable or, or otherwise good? Do you think it is net good, net better to, in what, whatever, however you take that, to work full-time for a creator or to be freelance working for multiple creators? And tangentially to that, do you think it is necessary to say, start as a freelancer and then move in or- better to start as full-time and then go freelance? Hmm. I would say, I think it's probably better to be full-time and then transition because as uh, as we kind of spoke about, being full-time just makes you understand the, the ins and outs of the entire business of a YouTube channel, right? You're not kind of just doing one thing for one creator, one thing for another creator, or one thing for multiple creators at the same time. Like at that point, you're kind of one dimensional. I feel like if you can work with any business full time, if possible, work across multiple areas, which you probably will working for a YouTuber because they don't have tons and tons of money where they can employ very specialized people. Um, you'll probably be, be a jack of all trades who does a bit of everything. You just pick up so many more skills and, and because of like how interlinked the different skills are on youtube you know if you if you think about script writing that that matters so much with the edit you know and and things like that matter so much when it when it comes to the the ideas and the, the titles and the thumbnails and like everything's interlinked and i feel like the more skills you can get the better and that i feel you'll 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 get a much better job working for someone and then going freelance as opposed to being freelance and working with so many different creators where you might have the opportunity to work then full time for someone and that might be better. Um, but I feel like 
being at f like freelance and, and working for yourself and working with other creators is like the ultimate goal. I don't feel like working full time for someone all of the time is like the best. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but it, for me, like, I, I just feel like I, I prefer this, you know, like I've had job offers from people, um, from big people in the, in the industry to work full time for like 30 K and above a month. And I say no, which if you'd said that to me a, a, a year ago would have been insane. But to me, I prefer the autonomy of, of being freelance. And I understand the long-term game of where I can go. And maybe I'm an idiot for saying no and not doing that for a year and making a ton of money and then going back to freelance. But for me, I just feel like it's better to, to, to build that foundation now that I've worked for a YouTuber full-time. I've worked in YouTube and TikTok agencies. And I understand just the, the leverage and what comes from building like your own personal brand is yourself working with multiple creators. Um, so a bit of a long answer. I, I hope I answered the question, but yeah. Yeah, you did, and and actually, I, I kind of I broadly agree, but I think the the only issue I I have with that um, is is that I I worry, and, and when I reflect on starting full time in the creator economy, I basically I worry that people, if they feel hamstrung by the idea that they should go full time first, that they won't dip their toe in or tr be able to or try doing little bits and pieces on the side of their job or their work or or whatever, and certainly. Although it's easy to say because having started with Ali, we were then basically able to work with lots of different people because lots of people respected his name. Um, I, I've i learned so, so much more only because of the spectrum of different people I've worked with since. And it's it's no surprise that even though we don't work with Ali anymore, they will occasionally ask to consult with us because we're now out and about working with lots of different people and gaining that knowledge quicker. And so I... I I don't have the experience to kind of back this up, but I, I do think if you can, before you've started at all, if you can just here and there do little bits of either free or hopefully paid, but just f bits of work here and there with some creators, I, I wonder if that might be a more efficient way of building up the skills before you make it into a job. Yeah, I think it's, um, if you're stuck and thinking, oh, should I apply for full-time or or do freelance stuff i would say like start doing freelance stuff it will make it so much easier to get the full-time jobs you want mm. i i would say like adding on to my answer um i think it's both you know i i think you can have a full-time job in the creator economy working just within social media marketing you know getting to influencer marketing as, as well is, is a very good way and you can freelance outside of that you know, it's, it's exactly what I did. You, you don't have to be one or the other. Um, and and to, to what you said, George, I, I, I do agree with you that it's it's probably better to start as a freelancer. But that is somewhat harder if, if we're talking like to, to, to the level that we're currently at. I think we're only here because we did the full time thing for, for, for many years before. I think that when you get started, as I said before, the, uh, the sort of the beginning of this podcast, if you can work for free or have a portfolio and or, or charge like a lower fee and just learn those skills doing freelance, that will get you the full time life or the the, the freelance life where it, you're not, you know, living paycheck to paycheck and it's a little bit more sustainable. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I just think it's both. I, I think like if you can get both, it's perfect. You know, just keep learning alongside your your day job and obviously if you're if you are 30 and you're in a, a job that's nothing related to do with the creative economy then your options really are to just kind of do the freelance thing and build a portfolio and try that way unless you really want to kind of like make that leap into you know a traditional job that's in influencer marketing um you know i did that i i, I worked for um like a YouTube agency right at the beginning. I then went and worked for um, like a, a, a fintech business in, in just their marketing department. Um, and that was nothing to do with influencer or social media marketing or anything like that. Really, it was just kind of like online marketing. And I wanted to go and work at, at a TikTok agency because I could see TikTok was becoming this big thing. This is sort of like at the end of 2019, I want to say. And like TikTok really took off at the beginning of the pandemic, like around March, 2020. So I was kind of just getting in there before that whole business just exploded and took off. And I wanted to work there as an account manager. And 
to get a job as an account manager when you don't really have that experience doing that exact thing in short form can be a bit hard. So I had to take a pay cut and go down and take like a junior account manager role. But I was happy to do that because I believed in myself and knew that I would very quickly get to where I need to be. And that's what I did. And so, you know, if you are in a in a position where you can take that leap from a, a non influencer role job into one that you can like what I did then you can do that but obviously there is a risk depending on because everyone has like different situations but that can be like the way that you get in 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 the door and all of that kind of stuff will just yeah as you spoke about help you kind of transition more into freelancing which I think is the ultimate long-term play is freelancing and then potentially having like your own business with employees after that yeah I think um I think it's I don't know about you guys, but I think, yeah, I, I, I want to spend more time thinking about what the long-term play really is. Is it, is it like, is it fully freelancing? Is it building a more personal brand on the back of that in order to do, you know, to do what? I don't have a full, a firm grasp on what the like 20 year plan is, um, but maybe that's a bit ambitious anyway. Yeah, I think it's hard to plan for something like that. You know, these, these things are changing all, all of the time. Um, like for me, I, I constantly change what, what, you know, someone said to me the other day, you know, where do you want to be in three years time? <laughs> I was just like, uh, I don't know. I don't know because it's, it's hard to predict. And yeah, it's just, it's just such a, a, a crazy world out there at the moment. And, I'm still learning myself on what I want. And I, I quite like, you know, again, mentioning Ali, his sort of approach of a lifestyle business of like, I work a certain amount of hours. I work on the things that I enjoy. I outsource and delegate the things I don't like to do. And I'm not here to optimize every single minute of every day and just squeeze as much money out of this as possible. It's like, I'll try my best to do that, but without breaking my back and working stupid hours, even though I do still do that currently. But I kind of like that approach as opposed to, you know, going and working full time for, for years and years and years where you kind of don't have that flexibility of your schedule, for example. Like for me, I really value that. And similar to Ali, that that's why he wants that lifestyle business of like, if he has to record a video, he'll say, I don't want to do that. I'll do it tomorrow or next week. And he'll just put it off because he can. And I, I kind of like like that approach. Mm -hmm. As much as that was at the uh, you know, the bane of our lives for a, a little while while we were there. <laughs> oh, he's recording it tomorrow, is he? Right. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I have a okay. So I have a question for Floor because I feel like often people say, "Yeah, you should go and do your own thing and like get yourself known and out there." Like, what are the actual specific, concrete? things you should do if you want to get started so i mean to get the ball rolling i was talking to a friend of mine who was thinking about getting into this stuff part-time and my first piece of advice was um get a twitter account follow all the relevant people um so if you know like one other person in the industry look at who they follow and follow a bunch of those people and the second one is just get some like functional website up and running really simply like if you use notion i think we all started off with like super dot so websites based on notion um so yeah those are my two starting points especially for writers um but what would you guys add well i think off the back of that yeah i like that and then the, the next thing i would say is in terms of building up the the credibility that you want to try and present on twitter don't just retweet a bunch of stuff that looks rubbish um even if you don't yet have experience doing any specific work what i really like is when people properly break down uh so for example a youtube strategist called loki jude it, i mean he's well established by this point so not the most relevant example but he does these kind of like hook breakdowns where he'll present he'll show you like an air rack hook over this course of like four years He'll highlight different bits of the text to kind of show where the twist is, where the, I can't remember what, how he breaks it down, but um, things like that. And so it's a way of like showing that you have an analytical mind, that you're actually able to think about YouTube and think about these things. Um, because then off the back of that, Twitter, literally every every client I've ever had um, since 
working for Ali has been through Twitter. Um, and even in some cases, it would actually be good to get your, like an, your anecdote, Gwilym, on your cold outreach that you did. But my, my recent pivot into the entertainment niche, even though at this point I had like 18 months of experience under my belt, I reached out to a like a million plus um, subscriber YouTuber on Twitter, just a cold DM and was basically like, hey, I'm looking to get more into this kind of thing. I would love to take a look over one of your uh, upcoming scripts free of charge, no expectation. I don't need to work for you. I don't want to work for you um, after this. I just want to do something that I hope will be valuable for you for free. Um, and if you can present something like that, that's like low lift to someone in the creator economy, ideally someone smaller, if you have literally zero experience, but just offer something to them that has basically no downside and potentially offer to do it for free. Um, they're way more likely to accept you, uh, accept that offer. And as a result of that, I was then basically able to lean into that when um, there was another entertainment YouTuber who I do now work for and has become one of my main clients. Um, when we were first talking, I was able to say, hey, full disclosure, it was only a little bit of work, but I have done a little bit for this creator. And that kind of credibility then starts to snowball. Um, so yeah, much agree, Gwilym, Twitter is the way to go, but try have your own takes and try and be proactive with the people that you're talking to. Don't just retweet stuff. Don't just like, if someone, ah, oh, this is one that really gets to me. When, when I tweet something and someone basically replies by just rewording what I've said, and then they'll put like, I'm certain that's a chat GBT thing because I've seen people do that. It automatically <laughs> will like take the tweet, put it into chat yeah. GBT and say, write a response to this. And it automatically tweets it. And people are doing oh, that to grow their God. accounts. And I read it and I'm like, yeah. you just said the exact same thing, but worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not good. It's not exactly. good. So, so don't do that. And to be like, honestly, the, the, the Twitter brigade will find you out if you're not a legit person. Like there was someone who was, I I mean, I won't name them because I don't know if they're still functioning, but I think we all probably know who I'm talking about, who was just kind of like parroting stuff that other people had said, mimicking other people's kind of visual designs. But It wasn't even parroting. It was like directly copying everything. And it wasn't like, here's my take on it. It was like, I'm just going to copy and paste it and reword it and tweet it as my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was what they were doing. He did that with some of my threads, and but then he'd like make the thumbnail that was a picture of my face with the word genius next to it, and I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this. Uh, you beautiful, uh, crafty. Um, he knows you're not yeah. going to shout at him if he uh, if he flatters you. <laughs> exactly. So don't be that. Don't be like that. Uh, but do use Twitter. I agree with I agree with everything that you both have said uh, around this. I think that. There are certain things that you you can do to kind of like when you DM someone to to try and help them. You know, I think in some cases you can do similar to what you did, George, which is like DM someone and say, hey, I'd love to help out. Um, I think if you have like a bit of clout, you have some experience behind you, like you have, it's much easier to have those conversations because they most likely know who you are. But if you are a beginner, the chances are that someone's going to see your DM. If you're, again, going for the big guys, it's, it's quite slim. You know, look for the medium to small creators. Um, but I think if you are going to go for the big the big guys, um, I wouldn't necessarily DM them if you don't have that experience um, asking. I feel like you should do the work and present it to them, right? So if we take a thumbnail designer, for example, rather than, hey, can I make a thumbnail de- you know, design for, for your next video for free, blah, blah, blah. You could instead just go on their channel, look at videos that they've already uploaded and say, I can make a better thumbnail than that. Here you go. Here it is for free. Um, I've done that for people and assigned big clients from that. I've just said, hey, here's a thumbnail. It's free. No charge. Use it if you want. They A-B test it. It performs much better than the original. And then they're keen to talk not just about thumbnails, but YouTube consulting. And like that's how I've got clients. And so I think if you're starting off, just make the thing and present it. Like it's so much easier for someone to say, yeah, you can design some more thumbnails for me because the one that you've made already looks great rather than, yeah, you can make one. And then they, they don't see your DM again because it's got buried, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's so much harder. I feel like to, to kind of get in the door with that approach of, of asking. I think, I, th- I feel like this applies to freelance work in general. Like how can you reduce the friction as much as possible for the other person? Like before you send the email, think what could the potential like solutions to this be? And then like list them underneath or um, yeah, uh, just anything you can to make it so that the other person can just say yes or no. Like something that has struck me for like the, the, the more like important or 
or busy a person is, the, the shorter their communication. They all like answer in very, very short sentences with no punctuation because they are like rammed with work. Um, and the more you can orient your mind around that, the more people will be like, oh, blah is so easy to work with. Like stuff just gets done without loads of DMing and back and forth. And that's exactly what your point is about, Shane. You're like, like make it easy for them to say yes. Yeah. And implement your thing immediately instead of asking like, oh, hey, I'm... Let me introduce myself. And if they don't get back to you, I would say feel free to like follow up with that a few days later, but don't become one of these annoying people in the DMs who I constantly get um, who are just trying to sell you something. Hey, do you want to get you know some new leads? I can help you with be a Twitter uh, ghostwriter. <laughs> and then like three days later, hey, buddy, uh, you send my message. <laughs> and then like a week later, they're like, they start getting aggressive and they'll just like do a dot, dot, dot. And then oh, a question mark, and no. then they'll just send you an, an emoji, and it's like I don't, I don't have time to kind of like respond to your cold outreach. And if that's your cold outreach as a Twitter ghostwriter, I don't want the service, you know. Yeah. And so, I feel like it's fine to follow up with people, but do it in like a tasteful way. Have some self awareness. Um, you know, bigger creators, obviously, like I said, are, are way more busier, and you're probably going to get buried in their DMs, and probably not going to check it. They probably have team members that do it, you know find a small to medium creator and work with them. And if you do want to go for the big guys, try and find someone on their team. You know, if they have a YouTube producer, go to them instead of the, the YouTuber because YouTube producers DMs are probably like not cluttered and you can get through to them. Um, so yeah, that, that'd be some of my, my thoughts. And actually just off of that, I think that's again, speaks to this like much wider point that I think extends beyond freelance, beyond the creator economy into just general work. Like I spent some time with my parents this weekend and my dad um, interviews candidates for the, the sort of job that he's in. And he says that it, it really, like the percentage of people who have spent even five minutes looking through the website to see what the thing is about, who've clearly actually made some, some prepara have done some preparation beforehand, is just vanishingly thin. And it is exactly the same experience just from what you were saying there, Jamie, in terms of the people that message me on Twitter and... and um, the the care and the effort and is just so minimal most of the time that if you are willing to just come across well and be polite and, and like you say self-awareness seems so lacking sometimes if you can do that you're already so far ahead of the game i'm so much more likely and and creators generally are so much more likely to to listen to you and reply yeah in I, fact, I think i would go even further and say like you could create a chat gpt prompt for yourself which is like, could you please make this polite, <laughs> concise, and self-aware? <laughs> and then type whatever crap you're going to send to someone. Yeah. <laughs> and then just get get a normal version and send that instead. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. as well, like, and this is something that I've learned, is just treat them like they're a human being. Stop putting them on a pedestal. Mm. Every single YouTuber that I've worked with who are quite big, I was a fan of their videos at one point. And I'd go on like the call with them for the first time or I'd meet them in real life and I'd be like going red and I'd be like, uh, uh, I'd be stuttering. I'd be feel really nervous. And then I end up working with them. And then afterwards I'm kind of like, oh, they're an idiot like me. Like they're just another person <laughs> who doesn't know really what they're doing. And like everyone is working it out as they go along. And that's not just creative economy. That's just life. And you hear so many people who are like 50, 60, 70. who's like, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just learning every single day. And that's the case with, with a lot of YouTubers, you know, that they're, they're human beings. They are people. They are not this rock star, superstar, like just treat them like a normal person. And yeah, just don't put them on a pedestal. And like you, I feel like you have so much more success just being friendly with someone and open and honest and just having just a normal human communication style, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that would be my, my advice as well. That seems like a potentially good place to sign it off because that is yeah. that is great advice. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah, I agree. Hopefully you guys listening to this enjoyed this first episode of a podcast that we don't currently know the name of. Um, we're aiming to put uh, an episode out every two weeks. Maybe it will go every week at some point. Who knows? Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to let us know because we want to know if you guys enjoy it. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for listening. And I guess we'll, we'll catch you all in the next episode. Bye.